Hello and welcome. This is Jesse Canone, and you are about to listen to one of my Live Pain-Free expert interviews, where I interview the leading health, fitness, medical, and healing experts in the world, true pioneers who are doing amazing things. So I'm bringing to you, without a doubt, the most powerful information that exists in the world today on how you can dramatically improve the health of your entire being, mind, body, and spirit. And this is true breakthrough information that you will likely never hear about on television, online, in magazines or newspapers, and certainly not from your doctor. So if you'd like to finally eliminate those nagging aches, pains, and injuries, if you'd like to have more energy, if you'd like to boost your immune system and prevent sickness and disease, or if you want to reverse and cure yourself of a current health condition, then sit back, relax your body, open your mind, and get ready to receive some powerful information that is going to change your life. Hello and welcome. This is Jesse Canone from Live Pain Free. I'm really looking forward to today's interview because I'm going to be speaking with Michael Kern, an osteopath and an expert in craniosacral therapy. And we're going to be talking about the many benefits of craniosacral therapy and just how it might be able to help you. He's the author of Wisdom in the Body, The Craniosacral Approach to Essential Health, and the founder of the Craniosacral Therapy Educational Trust, which has been training craniosacral therapists since 1989. Michael, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join me. Thank you, Jesse. I appreciate your invitation. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this. It's a therapy that's not too widely known, as with many things. There's not only a lack of information, well, not a lack of information, a lack of understanding for a lot of people, but also some misinformation. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about it myself and sharing this information with our listeners. Now, before we kind of dive in and get started, can you give us a little bit more background, a little bit more of your backstory? How did you end up working in craniosacral therapy? My way in was actually as a, as a patient, as a client. Uh, in my early 20s, I uh, was at a, quite a crossroads in my life, having no idea which way to go, what to do professionally, what to do personally. I was full of tension, had all kinds of neck problems, and went to go and see a craniosacral practitioner. And I found the sessions to be, first of all, really powerful, but secondly, really effective in helping me to move through all kinds of accumulations of stresses and unresolved patterns that I was holding in my body. That experience really uh, touched me, really impressed me. I was already exploring, studying various forms of body work, but then I decided to enroll on a six-year osteopathic training here in the UK, and included in that osteopathic training was craniosacral work. We started to learn it at undergraduate level in the last couple of years of that training. Is that standard? Because I don't think that's the case in the United States, but I'm not sure. Yeah, well, in, my, uh, in the old days when I was training, which was, what, 35 years ago, in the UK, craniosacral work, at least an introduction to craniosacral work, was included in most of the osteopathic courses that were being run at undergraduate level. Unfortunately, these days, things have changed. And now, it's certainly in the UK, it tends to be an elective module, which means that students, as they come towards the end of the training, will have a choice as to whether or not they wish to study craniosacral or sports therapy or visceral work or something like that. But uh, for many, many years, this work was really only available at postgraduate level to osteopaths. And I think that is still the case in the United States. That's what I thought. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, what is craniosacral therapy? Because it, like I said, I imagine many people listening even if they've heard of it, they may not really know and understand what it is or how it works. I think the simplest way I can, simplest way to, to introduce it is to say that it's a, a system of light touch therapy that is working with subtle movements that express themselves through the body. The principle is that if these subtle movements in the body are playing freely without restriction, without impediment, then there is a state of health and well-being. But because of maybe an accumulation of stresses, traumas from a whole range of different factors, from physical to emotional to nutritional to all kinds of different reasons, the way in which the body is able to express these subtle movements can become restricted and impeded 
consequently, we see this as a primary precursor to the development of symptoms, diseases, and pathologies. So the work is really about helping to free things up, but not necessarily freeing up the sort of the big, the sort of the large articulatory movements within the body, but the very subtle movements that can take place. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, can you actually give an example, as you're describing this, I'm imagining the way we might turn our head, tilt our head, and how that movement happens. Is that a good example? Actually, the movements that we're working with in craniosacral practice are described as involuntary movements. So they're not movements that result from deciding whether to pick something up, turn your head, move your body. The founder of this work was an osteopath called William Sutherland. And he identified that there are subtle rhythmic movements that can get expressed through the body or that do get expressed through the body and health. But these rhythmic movements are and they're connected in terms of body and mind. So how we feel, how we think, what we do will influence the expression of these rhythms. But they are essentially involuntary rhythms. They're movements that happen really as, a, let's say, a different kind of function to the function of voluntary motion. Right. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. It reminds me of, there's a Dr. Ohashi and his book is called Reading the Body and it's based on ancient Chinese medicine. But the reason I mention it is because in it, he talks about how the body forms physically based on stress, emotions, and all sorts of things. But so how we end up with ears tilted at a certain angle and eyebrows at a certain eye formation and eyebrows and cheeks and all these parts of our being that are affected by how we handle life. And the reason I say life, because of course there's so much that goes into it. I don't want to simplify it and say it's just stress. I always found that fascinating how you can like even how fingers curve and twist. I've tested this now, now that I you know have the book and every time I meet somebody, I first thing, one of the first things I do after looking at their eyes is I look at their hands and and I'm curious to see like, Oh wow, look at that finger. It really is curved. Oh, and I know that when that finger's curved, that's um, that's sadness or that's anger yes, uh, manifested yes. in the body. Yeah, so it's very interesting to me. The principles in this practice are that, uh, let's put it this way, I've never met somebody who's who isn't carrying some kind of stress strain or, or patterning. Mm-hmm. But the principle is that if there are no restrictions, if there are no accumulations of stresses or traumas in the body, then the body moves in very kind of full, balanced ways without these kinds of distortions. The patterning that we experience actually starts right at the very beginning of life. I mean, even we could say a single cell at conception is responsive to its environment. And of course, there was <laughs> once upon a time, a long time ago, we were all single cells and then those cells divided and the two became four, the four became eight, etc. Then we went through the whole process of cellular differentiation and forming particular cell types. And uh, in this way, uh, the body is formed. But throughout this whole process, you know, throughout our embryological development, throughout our fetal development, and then of course we, <laughs> we experience birth process, whichever way we're being born. But if it's through a, a natural birth, we're experiencing the, the movements through the birth canal and whatever pressures and pressures that can be introduced into the little one's body at that stage, we become influenced by so many different factors, you know, but right from the very beginning, right from our early embryological development, this whole process of patterning and conditioning can begin. And of course, it continues throughout the whole of our lives as as we meet new situations or have a car accident or a fall or an accident, whatever it might be. So in a way, we become, we could say, walking autobiographies of of how our health and how our, as you said earlier, how our life is able to kind of meet the experiences that we have. And the experiences that we're not able to resolve may remain with us as patterns of movement and also patterns of function and patterns of behavior. I just love what you said. We become a walking autobiography. That's such a great analogy. Absolutely. Um, I also want to go back just for a moment to something you said earlier about being a single cell and how responsive it is to everything in its environment. As humans, we tend to have this this feeling that we're just these fixed physical 
creatures, right? So we, we look at our physical body because we're visual and there's so much that we can't see and there's so much that we can't understand that we, we see our physical bodies and we think that's yes. what we are. We're this fixed physical thing. These are the bones I have. This is the skin I have. This is my shape and all that. I think we lose sight of what, or maybe we never even learn it, but what you just mentioned, which is how every single cell in our body is responsive, starting all the way at the beginning and continuing throughout our life as as, as you just say, exactly. I mean, this process is continuing throughout the whole of our lives and the body. We know that the body is constantly being reformed, constantly being regenerated, which is really where, the, where we could say the potential for healing and recovery is, that we're not a fixed system if we can create the conditions whereby this natural process of regeneration occurs. You know, all kinds of conditions, all kinds of situations may be, may be resolved, may be responsive. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing when you think about it like that. And, yeah. Uh, so in a way, we could say, you know, we, embryology is not something that just happened to us when we were you know, a little bunch of cells in our mothers, but it's something that's constantly happening. We're constantly being recreated, constantly being reformed. It also reminds me of kind of the DNA argument and how some people will believe that your DNA is fixed and it is what it is and it dictates your life and it dictates your health, it dictates who you are and all that. But of course, that's, they've proven that your DNA also is adaptable, as you said earlier, and changing over time. Absolutely. Uh, it's the conditions that are important. It's the what is called the epigenetic factors, the conditions that can help to switch that DNA on or switch it off. That will determine whether or not somebody will move forwards into a so-called inherited condition or inherited disease. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's another fascinating topic. I wanted to ask one more question before we move on. I don't know if energies is the right word, but let's say tensions, energies, stresses, whatever they are that mm. kind of get trapped in the body and create this subtle movement, if you will, subtle um, involuntary movement. Do these involuntary movements, do they affect our regular voluntary movement? So if I want to bend over and pick something up, does the fact that I have this energy and this involuntary movement ha pattern in my body stuck, does it affect my my intentional movement? Yes, absolutely. Maybe, Jesse, if it's okay, I'm going to maybe backtrack just a little bit, sure. just to kind of talk maybe a little bit more as an introduction as to what these subtle movements are, and then maybe I can try and address the, sure. the question that you've just raised a little bit more clearly. No, that sounds great. Um, basically, what we're working with are a series of subtle rhythms that can be sensed and experienced and palpated, and also nowadays starting to get measured expressing through the body. One of the kind of basic principles of the work is that life is expressed as motion. Actually, the natural motions that express through us are rhythmical in nature. Now, there isn't just one rhythm. There are a number of rhythms. But the founder of this work really asked or researched for many, many years, well, what could it be that is driving these subtle rhythmic movements that he was feeling, that he was starting to work with, that he was starting to support and promote and, and getting great results when he was doing that? And he came to a very... I would say simple conclusion, which is by no means simplistic, and that is that it is none other than the life force itself that is generating these subtle rhythms. So essentially, this is what we would call a, a vitalistic therapy. It's a, an approach that appreciates the presence of vital force as a prime mover and prime organizer of the human body. So it's very similar in that regard to some traditional forms of medicine, such as uh, Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine, where there is a very similar kind of principle. So, yeah, so as long as these rhythmic forces are expressing through the body without restriction, then there is health. If there are places where these organizing forces, these organizing rhythms are getting bound up or restricted, let's say, as a result of an accident or a shock or a birth trauma or even some kind of earlier trauma than birth trauma, then this is a pattern that we may carry, we may carry with us. We'll, I believe the human body is always doing the best that it can. It's always going to seek the best possible health given whatever circumstances, whatever conditions are present. That this natural expression of health in the form of these natural rhythms may become compromised. And this is where we may start to experience symptoms and dysfunctions. Uh, I just would like to kind of 
follow on what you're saying there because I think what I've noticed in talking to, to clients and people over the years is that oftentimes they think that they'll hear something like what we're talking about and they'll say, oh, well, you know, I never had a car accident. This is not affecting me. But I want to make sure people are really understanding that you rattled off a handful of things that could be traumatic or cause tension and so on. Like you said earlier, we all have this because we're all alive. And it goes from, I have a therapist used to say, trauma with a lowercase t to trauma with a big, huge, giant capital T. And we all have many of them of varying shapes and sizes throughout our life. And I just want to make sure that people recognize that if you're human and you're alive and you're listening to this, this is your experience. And so this is true for you and that all of your experience and your stress and all these things are affecting you. And it would be wise to kind of really see that and recognize that and then ideally work with it, as you said, to, to kind of assist your body in maintaining the optimal health that is possible. Absolutely right, Jesse. There's many, many influences. You know, we are complex beings. And so the example of a, a, you know, a road traffic accident or a broken bone or a fall, you know, that's quite obvious. There's a force that comes into the body and the body has to somehow accommodate for that. And if it's able, it will heal and dissipate that force. And hopefully there'll be no long lasting consequences, but that's not always the case. Um, but we're never just you know, none of us are just physical human beings. We are, there's our feelings, our thoughts, our emotional experience. So similarly, you know, a shock from a, a loved one or emotional stress or strain in a relationship, this will all influence how we hold ourselves, how we carry ourselves, and will influence the expression of these subtle rhythms and consequently influence how we function. So we really need to look at the whole person, we could say the relationship between the body and the mind and the forces that organize us. Yeah, that's wonderful. When you think about craniosacral therapy, and again, it seems obvious to me that it would be something that can benefit anyone and everyone. Are there particular conditions that it's better for or situations where you know, more helpful? There's certainly common conditions that will bring patients in for treatment. In a way, I guess there's a couple of ways of answering the question. I can tell you what is commonly experienced and what can commonly be resolved through this work. Maybe I'm going to backtrack a little bit and say that the, the understanding is that these rhythms that we're talking about, these subtle movements, carry some kind of organizing principle for the body and the mind. So, And this is really something that practitioners have just got to experience a great deal over the last 50 or 60 years, where... If these rhythms, if these natural subtle movements can be restored, we find that health increases, that pathologies resolve, that symptoms disappear. So the principle is that there's some kind of organizing principle, there's some kind of organizing force that is carried within these rhythmic motions. So from that point of view, the treatment is not really symptom-based. It's not that, oh, this is a treatment for this condition or that condition. This is a treatment that will increase our overall health. It will support our overall health. And that sometimes happens in very surprising ways. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, somebody I was working with just a, a few months ago, she was came to me because she was experiencing sleeping difficulties. And I had my hands under her head and was feeling quite a lot of stress and strain at the base of the skull and also into the brainstem where a lot of our stress responses get held or a lot of our stress mm -hmm. responses get mediated. And through the hands-on work, I could start to feel her central nervous system beginning to slow down, beginning to settle and beginning to let go. She also told me that she was experiencing a lot of eczema and it was getting very irritable and very difficult, raw red patches on various places around her body. And this was also part of her sleeping difficulty that she was getting up at night and having to, to scratch herself. She called me back the next day and she said, you know, not only did I sleep better last night, but my eczema went. I would never have thought, you know, I would never have described this practice as being uh, a treatment for eczema. But what I'm saying is you don't actually know when you support the rebalancing of the physiology, when you support the expression of health, all kinds of things can start to improve. Now, having said that, I would say a lot of 
patients will come in to see people like me for so-called stress-related conditions, back pains, headaches. I also treat a number of children and babies, uh, particularly if there's been difficult birth or maybe a difficult pregnancy. So it could be feeding difficulties, sleeping difficulties, things like colicky pains in babies. Mm. So these kinds of things will often bring people for treatment. But the range of possibilities is quite wide because the application of the therapy is not so much on treating the condition or trying to get rid of whatever the condition is present, but in supporting and increasing the expression of health in the body. And when you do that, that's when the conditions seem to respond. That's wonderful. So one follow-up question I have is, so when you talk about the subtle movement earlier in describing it, the movement of the life force or the vital energy in the body, is the symptomology, if you will, that most of us experience the restriction and lack of complete or the lack yeah. of these subtle movements? Okay. Yes, absolutely. And so we can get trained, we can learn how to sense, how to feel, how to put our hands on the body, put our hands anywhere on the body and feel how things are functioning at this level. So you can sense through your hands whether there are places of relative inertia or disturbance um, or whether that organ or bone or region is expressing its subtle movements in a sense of, let's say, openness and freedom from restriction. So the treatment is really based on finding where there may be these places of inertia within the body and then supporting the health to express within at those sites, at those places. Okay, yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. That really gives me a, a more clear kind of visual picture of what's happening in the body. And it actually kind of reminds me, I'm looking for a way to kind of make this picture even clearer for people. So, it, you know, many people are familiar with a frozen shoulder. That's a very, very obvious and big, significant example of stuckness. The whole joint is stuck. So yes. what I was imagining as you were describing it is little, in many cases, little tiny examples of that throughout the body, maybe not in the entire joint, but it could be in just one part of one muscle within a joint. And not only within the joints, uh, mm -hmm. this same principle will hold true for the organs of the body. So, for example, the liver may be holding some kind of strain or stress or the stomach or the gallbladder or the whatever, the, you know, the fascia or even the bone itself within the bones. It's not the movement is not only occurring at the articulations of joints and as a result of expressing through the muscles. This is really a whole body, whole person approach. That's, I just want to emphasize that because that's really a huge point you just made because, again, it's another example of how we tend to think of ourselves. We tend to think of ourselves as bones and muscles. We forget about the organs that are inside. We forget that they're living tissue just like... Absolutely. As just living like, tissue, they're expressing motion, they're expressing health. And if that's all happening well, then they're functioning well. Those living tissues are functioning well. Jesse, just coming back sure. to that example you gave, as you say, a kind of common condition of the frozen shoulder. So, of course, there's a number of different approaches to working with this, and it's not that one approach is right and the other approach is wrong. But one approach is to see if you can exercise and mobilize the shoulder and work with those kind of grosser movements, you know, the bigger articulations, increasing the range of movement, maybe through articulatory work, through soft tissue work, working on the muscles, working on the tendons, the ligaments, the fascia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Within this approach, what we're doing is that we're working with the micro movements, with these involuntary micro movements on the, let's say, based on the principle that if we can sort out the micro movements, the macro movements will take care of themselves. Basically, if those micro movements are playing freely, there is a restoration of the macro movement. So it's not using any kind of articulation or deep tissue work. It's really just orienting to these subtle movements, these very, you could say, slow, subtle movements that take place in the body, because essentially that will sort out the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, in fact, in trying to do the reverse is what most, how most treatment approaches approach the issue is just try to, in a way, it's almost like forcing it. 
Absolutely. So you're like, we're going to break this free. We're going to get it exactly. you know, loose and moving again. But And it's not not that it's wrong. You know, I mean, it may work if, if the person can deal with it, if they can cope with that. It could be fine. But in a way, we could say this is a little bit more, let's call it work from the inside, work from the inside out rather than from the outside in. And would you agree that approach, the, the more aggressive, if you will, let's break this loose and, and get it moving again, that type of approach, it probably can never be as effective without addressing the issues that you're talking about because doing stretching and fascia work and all that is addressing the physical stuckness, but it may not be as addressing some of the other energetic or emotional stuckness that created it or contributed to it to begin with. Yeah, I think that is the tendency. I mean, I certainly couldn't say that it never works. I think clearly it does sometimes work. And I think that a therapeutic process may be triggered or activated in a number of different ways. There's not just a single way mm -hmm. for doing that. But I think it is certainly the experience of many people who have experienced this kind of body work or who practice it, that you may help to get something moving. And then two, three days later or a week later, the condition has returned and you have to keep doing that. Now, what that's indicating is there's something there that has not been addressed. There's something that's holding this pattern in place, something that's organizing it, that is still working, that still hasn't been addressed, and consequently the uh, conditions and the symptoms return. I would say certainly I practice this work because I experience it as being more effective, but of course I'm biased, but that is my experience. One yeah. thing I would just add is that in my experience, in all the years that I've been helping people to get rid of back pain and other types of pain, what I've noticed is oftentimes the, the person will do all the physical things that are quote unquote right that they should do, yet they still are missing that last bit. So we'll get a lot of calls and emails from people. Ah, oh, you know what? I did the muscle balance therapy. I did the inversion therapy. Yeah. I've got massage therapy. I've done physical therapy, chiropractor. I've done all these things and it's helped. I'm 80% pain free, yeah. but there's that last bit that I can't get rid of. And yes. you know, maybe they've made the dietary changes as well, and they're eating better, and they're drinking cleaner, and so on. In my experience, it's usually, uh, for a lot of people, it's the emotional, the tension in the body, the tension that's trapped yes. in the body of whatever various forms that has not been dealt with. And in my experience, the physical things all work better, and oftentimes less of them are required if you yes. address the energetic stuff that kind of that, that you're talking about here today. That's absolutely right. This is certainly how I see it as well, in that let's say if we can address what's organizing the body, if we can address the forces that organize how we function, then the therapeutic process can take place at a far deeper level. So interesting. I'm just fascinated always by the miraculousness, if you will, of our body and of our beings and how intricate and sophisticated and all these different yeah. things working together. And You're absolutely right. And the, the also another principle maybe I can just draw to your reader's attention is that we are constantly seeking health. We're constantly seeking the optimal balance. I don't just mean seeking mentally or emotionally, but the body is constantly seeking the best possible health that it can, given whatever conditions are present. Now, it might be that those conditions involve a lot of accumulations of stress or trauma or toxicity or emotional, whatever, unresolved emotional patterns. But this impulse, this, let's say, this drive to seek optimal balance is um, something that never really leaves us. It's, it's, I would say it's quite an active principle, sometimes difficult to believe when we're really stuck in our patterns of distress and pain and disease. That, well, you know, what on earth has happened to my health? Yeah. The health is still there. The health is still doing its best, given the conditions. So in a way, all we've got to do is create the conditions whereby this natural tendency to health and balance, we would say, I would say, where these forces of health are able to more freely express themselves, if we can create the conditions for that to happen, then those deeper changes can take place. Well, and uh, what just occurred to me, too, is as you were describing that, how the body is constantly seeking the optimum automatically. Exactly. Again, we're not doing it. Some of us are doing it consciously. Maybe some are not. But you're talking about this innate, automatic, seeking balance and optimal health. What's so great about that is if we can remember that when we do have whatever we're dealing with, as you were saying it, I was like, even with my little nagging aches and pains that I have, you know, as throughout the conversation, I'm thinking, oh, I got to see how this can help me with, with these things. And, and what I realized is 
I even, and I do this for my work and I have for many years, I still sometimes lose sight of that fact that my body, no matter how achy, whatever I'm dealing with, it's doing its absolute best automatically for me yes. all the time. If I remember and recognize that, and the more often the better, wow, it totally shifts your perspective into a much more positive just a much more positive overall state. In many ways, Jesse, this involves us making friends with our bodies. Mm -hmm. So many of us, we go through life battling ourselves, you know, and if the body then starts to develop a symptom or express some pain, it's like, oh my God, you know, we kind of, we think it's something wrong with the body. But if we're really following this principle through, we would say, you know, the body's always right. The body never lies. Whatever it's doing, it's doing it because it's the best that it can do given those conditions. Part of this process can also involve listening to the body, making friends with the body, listening to what the body is actually saying, what the body is actually doing, and working with that deep intelligence within the body rather than battling against whatever it is that the body is trying to show us. It basically brings up two words for me. It's like self-love, loving yourself and loving your body, not just your body, but your whole being and listening to it, as you said, and caring for it in a way that we tend to care for others. And how many of us actually do that? You know, these things, right. of course, this I'm really appreciative that a lot of the things I'm saying, in a way, they're very easy to say. They're not so easy to do. <laughs> but this is a practice. This is something that we can learn. We can move further and further within ourselves to do this, to live like this but also appreciate that this is something a lot of us have to practice. And very often it's also something a lot of us have to unlearn. We have to unlearn the different ideas and thoughts that we have about ourselves and the different patterns of behavior, physical patterns as well as psychological patterns, mm -hmm. in order for these kinds of changes to take place. Sure. I mean, even just how we think about something when it happens, when we get an ache or a pain, yes. how we, like you said, if you view it as, oh man, come on body, don't break down on me. Exactly. Instead of, oh, okay, I've, I've got, I've got this. I, I, I've this got is the body telling me something. Exactly. You know, normally, you know, our response will be just to kind of push through it and go for the burn or whatever. It might. Right. But very often that will lead. You know, it's okay if the person has, let's say, the, the resources and the capabilities to do that. But um, that unfortunately will often lead us into an even greater strain and more difficulty. This has been fascinating, very informative. I've learned a lot today about craniosacral therapy. And I would like to ask you before we wrap up, are there any other key points or considerations that people need to know or you think would be important to know about this type of work? One thing that I've not mentioned yet is, um, so, so what actually happens in a craniosacral session? Okay, yeah, that'd be um, great. So the practitioner would put his or her hands on the body, would feel for the presence of these subtle rhythms. And if there is an area of distortion or relative inertia, there are a range of skills that can be used in this practice. But the skills are light touch skills, so there's no kind of deep forcing. It's really working with starting to synchronize to what the body itself is wanting to do. Or we could say, what are the, the forces expressing through the body? What are they wanting? to do? How are they wanting to work? So essentially, the practitioner is just following these natural, as you described, innate tendencies and capabilities that are playing through the body and supporting them where needed. So this can be done without being invasive. It's really a lot of the time a question of just following what is innate, what is inherent. And interestingly, the and this is an experiential thing that has been, I would say, identified by hundreds or thousands of practitioners over the, the last many years, is that it's very often in conditions of settling, physiological settling and physiological stilling. In other words, in conditions where we're able to access some kind of state of ease within the body, this is the time or this is the place where these deeper patterns where the forces that are basically holding muscles in tight contraction or restricting the movement of an organ. It's in those states of settling and ease that the changes can take place. So a lot of the work is about just following the ease and supporting the settling within the body and then simply allowing the body to self-correct and self-heal. That totally makes sense and it reminds me of what we were talking about earlier with a lot of other approaches where you know we can try to force a muscle to relax by yeah. stretching it, right? But oftentimes what might be needed is that a release, 
uh, like a, a letting a letting go exactly yes. getting to that place of of deep relaxation and stillness so you can actually have a letting go or a release absolutely uh, occur yeah, that's a key principle yeah that's great so you're in London and you've been training people you teach all around the world you've been training people since 1989 I don't even know how many years that is off the top of my uh, head nor do quite, I off the top of my head but it's a, a fair few yeah yeah quite a while if people want to seek this out and I'm sure many people are going to want to obviously they can reference your website for more information which is, which is cranio c r a n i o dot c o dot u k again cranio dot c o dot u k and so they can learn more about all the work that you do but if people want to go beyond that and they want to try to find somebody yes. uh, in their area, are there any recommendations that you have? Yeah, there's uh, a registering organization in the United States of craniosacral practitioners, which is called the uh, Biodynamic Craniosacral Therapy Association of North America. And they're based at craniosacraltherapy.org. So I don't know if I need to spell that out, but cranio. No, I think we're good. Yeah. You're good. Okay. And similarly, there's a register in the United Kingdom, which is called the Craniosacral Therapy Association of the United Kingdom. And they're based at craniosacral.co.uk. Now, both of those organizations maintain registers of practitioners. So people can just go onto those websites and have a look and see if there's somebody practicing in your area. Okay, wonderful. And then Again, I mentioned at the start of our uh, conversation today, and that is your book, Wisdom in the Body, which I just recently received. Haven't had a chance to finish it yet, but it's wonderful and tons of great information in there. So people can find that on your website or on Amazon. Uh, they'll find that on Amazon or you can get it through bookstores. It's published by North Atlantic Books, but it's generally available. And it's also gone into about 10 other languages as well. So you may be able to find it in other countries too. But yeah. if your readers are interested in learning a little bit more about this practice, then that might be a good place to start as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. In fact, we do have readers and members all over the world. Some of them might actually uh, be looking for a non-English version. So that, that's great to hear. Great. Uh, well, well, this was wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, well, Jesse, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, uh, inviting me. I've really enjoyed our conversation and really appreciate what you're doing and the work that you're bringing out into the public domain. And I just hope this is of some interest and some benefit to, to the people who subscribe to your magazine and, and the work that you do. So many, many thanks for inviting me. Oh, yeah, thank you. I'm sure they're going to find it just as interesting and um, exciting as I found it today. Thank you again, and uh, maybe we can have another conversation in the future. I'd love to keep in touch. Jesse, I'm very happy to do that. My best wishes to you. All right. Thanks again. So, what did you think? Did you find this interview eye-opening, informative, and helpful? I'd love to get your feedback. Please let us know what you think by emailing us at editor at livepainfree.com or give us a call. 800-216-4908. And while it's fresh on your mind, who do you know who could really benefit from what you just heard and learned? Go ahead and please share it with them. Our mission here is to completely transform the way people think about and care for their health. So please help us reach even more people. Everyone deserves the best chance at optimal health and wellness. And if this interview was shared with you, and you are not a current Live Pain-Free member, head on over to our website, www.livepainfree.com, now and sign up for a free trial membership. I'm certain you'll find it one of the best investments you make in yourself. Thank you again for listening, and I wish you love, peace, health, and happiness.